24 candidates here tonight, and we want to make sure uh, that all of you have an opportunity to hear from all of them. Uh, so if you continue to come in, this is so quiet, uh, I recognize it's very crowded. We apologize. Yeah, about that. halfway through when I get my uh, legs so to very encouraged to come out here. About halfway through? Uh, yeah, I'm the president of the It's going to be hard to move this camera. It's already on. Uh, we are honored to host this uh, 2016 mayoral candidates forum in conjunction uh, with the Charles. Are you going to move it back for me back here? Okay, okay, okay. 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 Halfway through. Uh, as long as I have this big crowd on behalf of the NBA, I do want to make two quick plugs and then we'll get started. Uh, the first plug is, you know, it's important not to just come to events like this, but to be involved I'll in the community. Uh, you know, grassroots support, grassroots involvement is, is really where change begins, I believe. Our neighborhood association has our meeting on the third Tuesday of every month at 7.30 uh, here at the Belvedere, traditionally on the first floor. Uh, so I look forward to seeing those of you who live in our community uh, on March, uh, third Tuesday, March at 7.30. The second plug, uh, just real quick, is we are trying to import, encourage, like I said, more of that involvement. Uh, we're trying to set up a system of block captains so that we can have better communication both downwards to every block in our neighborhoods and upwards to our association. If you live in the neighborhood and you'd be interested in becoming a block captain, I would encourage you to uh, talk to my Vice President, Michelle Richter, during our intermission that we're going to be taking after the first 12 candidates go. Uh, she has a sign-up sheet back there uh, in the foyer out here. Uh, and we would really love to see some of you guys become block captains. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Karen Stokes right here, and then I'm going to lay out the, forum, uh, the format of tonight's forum, and then we will begin. Uh, this is Karen Stokes. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a tremendous turnout, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, an overcrowded room is a great sign for this moment of democracy here. Um, my name is Karen Stokes. I'm the CEO of Strong Street Baltimore, and I also serve as the vice chair of the Charles Street Development Corporation. And the Charles Street Development Corporation is um, a one of the co sponsors. And Charles Street is not one of the, uh, it's it probably Baltimore's original main street and the historic and cultural center of the city. Um, we like to call it the spine of the city. And we have diverse stakeholders here, world class art museums, educational institutions, businesses, and neighborhoods. Um, some of the topics that we have asked our candidates to focus on tonight are things that we know are near and dear to uh, those folks who live in this particular part of the city. Transportation, economic development, uh, social services, uh, in this corridor in particular, uh, in the area of the Ogalcha neighborhood, um, where we have uh, quite a few residential and other social service agencies. In terms of our economic development concerns, we see this as a very important part of the city, just like the harbor and Harbor East is in South Baltimore. Uh, this is the historic part of our city, and we want to make sure that we continue to have thoughtful economic development here. Um, infrastructure is important, and, uh, uh, and of course, safety as it is in all parts of the city. So thank you very much for uh, coming tonight. Uh, Brian's going to talk a little bit about how we're going to do this. Um, thank you for your patience. We're going to uh, uh, unfortunately not have opportunities for a lot of Q&A, though it is an opportunity, probably the first time, or at least have more of the participants who are running for mayor right now than maybe any other four that I've gone to so far. So thank you again for coming, and Brian will describe our, our format. All right, so we have uh, 24 candidates here tonight. Uh, we're going to start with Karen Stokes, and then we'll move on to Brian. So we have uh, 24 candidates who have said they would be here tonight. I think most of them are here. Uh, because of that, we're going to give an opportunity equally to all of them to speak. Uh, our candidates will be speaking one at a time, uh, going in alphabetical order, uh, also by party. So the Democratic candidates will speak first in alphabetical order. Uh, followed by the Green Party, followed by the Republican candidates, followed by the unaffiliated candidates. Uh, after the first 12 candidates go, which are our 12 Democrats, we're going to take a brief uh, five-minute intermission. Uh, if you do not plan to stay for the tonight's entire event, we would ask you to, first of all, leave respectfully and quietly, but also to perhaps do so during that intermission. Uh, after that intermission, we will invite the other 12 candidates onto, uh, into the front here, and they will go. Each candidate is going to speak one at a time. As I said, they're going to speak, uh, be given 
seven minutes to speak. We're really going to try to hold them to that seven minutes. Uh, they're asked to split that time uh, as they would like, but we're suggesting they split it between making a statement and then taking questions. Uh, if you would like to ask a question of the candidate, what we'd ask you to do is come up to this mic we have in the front uh, so that everyone can hear you and ask a question. Again, due to the short number of minutes that every candidate's going to get, not every question is going to be answered, but we'll do our best. Um, so, without further ado, let's begin. Uh, Mr. Christian Q. It's a disgrace, and we need to get back on the right track. 
We need to do it now. That's why, that's why I'm going to play a ball for you. Thank you. If you would like to come up and ask a question, you can come up to the mic right here.
Incidents that happened in April would not have happened under my administration. And I'm going to tell you why. First of all, crime didn't go down until I became mayor of Baltimore City. And it came down because I didn't arrest our way out of this. What I did was I focused on the most violent offenders. We created a gun registry. But we also engaged our officers in the community working with the citizens of Baltimore. Not just sitting in their cars, but involved and engaged with the citizens of Baltimore. And fourth but not least, we also involved the citizens to be a part of the process. What I'm going to do moving forward, and please I encourage you to go on my website, and this is just for my crime plan, we have a four-point plan, and that is that we're going to enhance the Severe Review Board, where the Severe Review Board will have um, not only staff, support staff to work with those individuals who are appointed, but individuals who have cases with police can provide in incident cases before the Severe Review Board so that they can have them addressed. We're not going to arrest our way out of it. We have to have to work with diversion programs. I want to engage and enhance community schools where we have mental health services in our schools that are going to help and work with families and children within schools. We're going to provide training programs, not city government, but we're going to work with effective entities within our communities and provide the resources from the city in order to create job opportunities, entrepreneurship, and, as well as enhance businesses in the community. Now, it's only seven minutes, and I want to just touch on a couple points. A lot of people bring up about what happened with Freddie Gray. And in that incident that happened, there's a lesson for all of us. But what we have to begin to do is we need to begin to sit down and have a dialogue, a real dialogue, about what's happening in certain communities and what's not happening. And how do we balance what happened? Now, we sit in the midst of Mount Vernon, and I can give you point after point about the circulator that I created that enhanced tourism in the Mount Vernon community. I can also talk about the effort that I worked on with the Mount Vernon community and residents in this um, community to enhance with the Washington Monument and enhance that. I can also talk about the MOU that we put together as relates to the Housing Resource Center that the current administration ignored, where we were working with some concerns as relates to homelessness. But what I'm going to do moving forward is we're going to work together to enhance and increase opportunities. Tax base. I reduced the property tax over the last several years when I was there, but it's going to take new revenue sources to enhance. The biggest thing and the most important thing, and then I'm going to stop because there's so many people that have many questions, is that we have to have accountability in city government. So every agency will have a performance audit and we will start from a zero-based budget to determine what's going to go in the budget and how are we going to disseminate the money to city government in order to enhance our programs and opportunity for all residents. So I want to stop because I'm going to use my time with hearing questions from each of the audience. Well, first of all, let me say this. Um, I made a bad choice. I would still be mad if I had to disclose the relationship and gifts that were given to me when I was city council president. I learned from that mistake, and moving forward, I did disclose everything from down to a pen that was given to me when I was mayor. I know it's going to take trust for the community, but I know what it takes to, to run city government. I paid the price. I moved forward in my life and my family and, and others who I disappointed. But I also know that my passion and love for this city is going to move the city in the right direction. And so yes, I know I'm going to have to gain trust in people in this city. So I appreciate that question. Uh, yes, as far as uh, you know, the resources, um, have you considered, if you consider, say, um, 
an income tax on income for in the city, such as like a tax or something like that, or what is the income tax? First of all, we need to really assess all the taxes that we currently have. And we don't really, I would not encourage a commuter tax because I then would not want Louisville County or any Louisville County to um, enforce a commuter's tax. But what we need to do is, first of all, we need to stabilize and look at what we currently have as far as taxes that we are charging to the public and reassess whether or not we need a container tax, whether or not we still need the communication tax that now people who have cell phones have to pay, and a lot of times people then find an address in another part of the state. So what we need to do is really assess all of our taxes to see what we need to have in order to function the city government. Because right now, the main taxes that we use for our general fund is the property tax and the piggyback tax. But we need to really do an assessment of all our taxes, but I would not encourage any new taxes. If anything, I want to reset taxes that we've been using over the last five years. We have time for one more question. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I want to be able to say, first of all, that I know that in the past you've been very supportive of Mount Vernon uh, community, and we've all been very appreciative of you. And I appreciate the other question, and I appreciate your answer about the, the, the gift card circumstance. But, I guess what I'm having a difficult time reconciling since that episode is the fact that, you know, on your campaign finance reporting, you had 11 amendments um, with a discrepancy of almost $100,000 in a period of three months of 11 amendments to the reports. And, you know, and, and I know you said you were surprised by that, but, you know, I just want to know that whoever I'm supporting is having people that are managing the city or bringing people in, whether it's your campaign, whether it's the city, that you are managing the finances of this city. Because That's honestly, right. there's a lot of like belief, you know, in terms of the finance and people. This room is a testament to why people are really upset. Donald Trump is not making the headlines because they're not bringing it. Sir, can you ask your question? Too far. Well, going on. I think I understood this question. Because sometimes everything that you read is not correct. But let me let me just clarify this. First and foremost, and I made it. Uh, I shared this this morning on the radio. When I found out about the discrepancy because of a software glitch where they changed the state chain from one software to the other, I immediately had a company come on board and clear that up. We worked with the executive director who was quoted in the paper and went through item by item with that individual. So part of this tactic, sir, I'm sorry, is there are individuals who are on who are part of the Democratic Party who don't want to see me move forward and try to tear me down. But I'm not going to allow that to happen because we cleared that up once we got it straight right away because of a uh, software glitch. And we straightened it out. And that's um, what happened. Thank you. Um, 
So I am I'm excited to be here tonight. I want to talk for a minute about my background in public safety, and then I want to talk about this neighborhood specifically and what I think um, is needed in this neighborhood to support the work that's being done here. So I have, um, I, as I said, I spent my career in government, mostly in city government. I've been a prosecutor, a line prosecutor handling violent crimes, but also deputy state's attorney. And as deputy state's attorney in the last administration, we reduced crime in partnership with law enforcement to levels not seen in almost 40 years. It was, a, it was an historic drop. We had homicides under 200 for the first time in almost four decades. That's incredible. And we also focused on violence, on uh, property crime, and crimes that were afflicting neighborhoods across the city. And we saw historic reduction. And we did it, it's important to note, at the same time that we cut arrests in half, at the same time that we diverted thousands of additional nonviolent drug offenses out of the system and the public health system where they belong. And it's proved in Baltimore, it's proved across the nation, that public safety does not demand mass incarceration. It does not demand zero tolerance. In fact, smart policing and progressive approaches to criminal justice make our city safer. So I'm very proud of the work I did there. I've also worked at the Department of Labor, working on how to make our workforce stronger and aligned with the jobs that exist and the jobs that are coming. I worked in New York City at the Housing Department on affordable housing financing and how to get private dollars in the neighborhoods. And I've also worked in City Hall as a lawyer, as the director of the Mayor's Office of Municipal Justice, and I've worked all fold for two state attorneys, for two mayors, and for a governor. And I've seen what works. I've seen how important management is. I've managed over 400 people. I've managed complex budgets, complex federal and state grants. And I've seen how easy it is in city government for progress to stall. You don't have a leader who is motivated every day and every second to drive the city forward, to focus on the small things, on the potholes and the trash, but also on the big things, and align all the efforts that are in this city around what matters. And that means addressing the concentration of poverty in the city, the disparities in our systems, the unbelievable staggering disparities across the city, the fact that a child is born in Roland Park has a life expectancy 20 years longer than a child born in West Baltimore. And as mayor, I will devote every minute of every day to addressing those disparities through every lens of city government, from housing, criminal justice to um, our public health system. And in the criminal justice system, there are examples, and I talked about this.